up? This is Liam from Cancer Brats, and you're walking in Bucket List! with Bucket List Music Reviews, talking with Liam Cormier here from Cancer Bats. So, Liam, you know, uh, threw us kind of a curveball today. We were going to be talking about Hail Destroyer, but there was new albums yet, so I guess we got to talk about that. But we don't have to, but if you like <laughs> to, I'm Absolutely. so more than excited. Yeah. So what can, what can you tell us about this new album? Like, what makes this one different from the last one? Um, well, I guess this is the first record that we've ever officially put out ourselves. So this is our, our first endeavor in kind of our own label, and that again was why we wanted to do the like secret release yeah. and sort of shake things up and not do the traditional kind of like pre-order, pre-roll, you know, teaser videos and stuff like that. I guess we had a little baby teaser video that came out a couple days ago. Mm -hmm. We had like a little mysterious website, but for most of all, we yeah, we just wanted to like kind of try something different, have fun, shake it up. Yeah. So why the do-it-yourself thing? I remember last album you did was with Ross Robinson. Ross Robinson. Ross Robinson. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it was great. I mean, we had a really awesome opportunity uh, working with BMG, and we really like you know loved that. And they wanted us to work with Ross, or they provided us the opportunity to work with Ross, which was great. And we had an amazing time, and I'm super stoked on that record. And this time around, we we're again, we we're just like, you know what? Like we're out of contract with all of these like labels, and again, why don't we try and just sort of get back to like our roots of doing things and just go completely DIY and uh, kind of just like write the record when we were feeling like writing a record and mm -hmm. go and record it when it was finished and not have any, you know, like hard deadlines or anything like that. Like just kind of going back to like having fun and being in a band. Cool. So how long did this one take to do? Because with it, with it coming out so suddenly and everything, there isn't a lot to go on. Did you guys, you're saying do it yourself, did this, did you, do it like as many takes as you needed, or was it sort of like, you know, one try, no click track sort of thing? Uh, when we, we took a long time to write everything, so we wanted to kind of like make sure we had a lot of good stuff to go into the studio with. Um, but I will say once we were in the studio, we didn't have a ton of time, again, because of budgets and things yeah. like that. And also I think there's something to be said about having that creative energy that is like a deadline. Like just being like, you can't do a hundred takes of this. You can only do, you know, X amount until it's right, and then you have to move on and because the next person has to do their part. So I really like having like a, a shorter time constraint. That being said, we actually recorded this record in less time than we've recorded any of the albums. Um, I think it's because at this point we're able to record a lot more live, and we're you know better players and able to do even less takes than I think we had previously. So a lot of the stuff was done live off the floor. Um, and a lot of the like drums, bass, vocals, even some of the guitars were kept from those original passes. Um, so when it came to actually like filling in the bits for like the record, we were already way ahead of the game. Nice. So you're saying that this was kind of like a back to your roots sort of thing. I was noticing with the last album, it was a bit sludgier and everything. But would you say that you were trying to get away from that sound or? I don't know if we, we were so much trying to get away from it, but I think in a lot of ways we we sort of did that with these songs mm -hmm. and we had a great time and there was, you know, a bit of a harsher kind of vibe on the last record that we were all feeling when we were writing and that we all had to kind of like work through. Mm -hmm. But with this record, I mean, it's like, yeah, we have these awesome sludgy songs. We have Arsenic and Nearest Snake. You know, like we love playing these, but it's like in the same way, like we don't need to write that same song again because we have it for the set list. Yeah. So there was a lot of those conversations that were just like, okay, what are we putting in our set list? Mm -hmm. And what do we feel like we're kind of missing or we could do better? Or like, what is a vibe of Cancer Beds that we really love that we haven't done in a while? And I think that's one of those conversations that led to like Brightest Days and We Run Free and like some of those more like kind of lighthearted songs mm -hmm. that I feel like we wanted to have just as like a really fun thing to have in a set and a really fun song to play with our fans. So it was like those kind of like conversations. Yeah, so you're saying it was mostly like kind of for fun? Yeah, so. well, and, and in jamming those, like it was like, you know, writing Gatekeeper was like super fun. It was like Jay playing guitar and me playing drums and like oh, really? banging through this song and just being like, this is awesome. And like making a voice note like on our phone and then like emailing it to like Scott and Mike and being like, we just yeah. wrote this fun 
like super rad song. And same with Better Nails, we were like, we just like banged out this song, what do you guys think? And then it was everybody else's input, like kind of shaping it into a cancer rat song, mm -hmm. and not just Jay and Liam jamming, uh, because we're the only two people in town at that <laughs> time. So it was, it was like really fun in that aspect, and I think because we had so many other things going on, like in our lives, like it meant when we would come together and have band practice, it was just like back in the day when you were having a, you know, a jam with your friends because it's fun. Totally. Uh, was this the first time that that's happened? You're saying, did you end up, did your drum take end up being the one you used? Something? No, 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 no. no. Yeah, but, so you just wrote it like that? And there's lots of times where like I'll jump on the drums to like start an idea and people will kind of like, um, you know, be on different instruments and throw around different ideas. But I feel like this was the, the most we've done that just because Mikey lives in Winnipeg now. Oh, yeah. So it kind of just meant like to be able to get some of these songs going and to send an idea to Mike who could then, you know, play drums over top of it. Mm -hmm. It was just like, well, here's what I did. Like, send me through your idea of what you're thinking. And sometimes, you know, I'm playing a drum part that Mikey's already written. Like when Jay and I were working on Winterpeg, it's like we're jamming ideas that we've maybe all started together, but then Jay and I take it a little bit further play it for everybody else, and then it's like they have their input as well. So it, it was really fun, like, that side of things to be kind of, like, sending demo ideas back and forth. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds like it would kind of help with the creative process. Yeah. Bit, because yeah. everyone could just put in their own idea. Totally. How you think of it? And be able to reflect on it, and yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. Um, is that different from how you guys did the previous albums? Like, were you sending stuff to each other then too, especially Hail Destroyer? We were always making demos, uh, I think, as obviously technology kind of caught up and it became a lot more affordable. Um, but we've always... Now it's nothing. Yeah, now it's... It used to be like $10,000 oh, on yeah. your phone. Exactly, and like that's like one of the one of the pieces that you hear at the start of We Run Free. Like, that's like just the voice note demo. That's at like the start of the song. Oh, that so we you did thought real garage. Yeah, real we were, we were just like, we actually left the stuff in. And that vibe is like such a cool like you know texture to have, uh, yeah. and kind of like you know references back to like this demo idea. But I mean, every other record has been predominantly the four of us in a room. Mm -hmm. I mean, Hail Destroyer, we didn't have a bass player when we wrote that record. Oh, so it was it just... Who was bass on that one? With you? Really yeah. nobody. We just wrote the record like kind of without bass. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then Jay joined basically like as we were touring, like even the end of 2007. So he was around and was in the band, but he just didn't record with us because we just figured it'd be quicker. And I think he probably just worked oh, yeah. while we were in the studio. <laughs> Gotta keep that stuff going. So I'd like to talk about Hail Destroyer quickly. For those mm -hmm. viewers that don't know, Camps Bats here are going to be doing the 10th anniversary of Hail Destroyer mm -hmm. here at Lee's Palace. And I gotta ask, when you recorded that 10 years ago, did you think in 10 years that you'd still be playing Lee's Palace with this record? Oh, we had. <laughs> I mean, I think we would have been like blown away if we had even headlined at Lee's Palace. You know, yeah. like, that was like where we went to see like bigger shows. And mm -hmm. that was like such like... You know, that's where, like, the Melvins play, and that's where, like, Black Mountain play, and, like, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, that was such, like, a different venue, whereas we headlined, like, the Mod Club, which for us at that time was, like, the biggest venue we had played. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean... And Hail Destroyer kind of took you guys to, like, the next level. Yeah, so, totally. And yeah. Yeah, I think that's, like, sort of the, the bigger thing with that record is that we were just trying to, like, put out an album that we thought was awesome, and then we kind of, like be able to keep us on the road. Yeah. We hadn't really thought, you know, that it would do that well or that like people would kind of gravitate towards it that hard. Yeah. So it was awesome. And it did do well, didn't it? Like you guys suddenly saw I remember the first time I ever saw you was on your tour with Billy Talent right after that one first time out. Oh yeah. And all of a sudden you're playing the Air Canada Center. Like yeah. I that feel and it was just poof. It was great. Off. Like things started really really going awesome and a lot of people like especially around the world mm -hmm. got behind the record so yeah. like it came out in the UK it started doing really great in the UK and in Europe and in Scandinavia and Australia and all these places where we kind of never thought we would be going yeah um, we were now like having fans and like our shows were actually doing really well and that for us was like the big record that kind of took hold in the UK yeah 
you say the UK, I see you guys are going there in like four days, aren't you? You're doing a bunch of back-to-back -back shows. Yeah, we're doing a bunch of shows there, too. Yeah. Have you always found that you got a good reception there? Or? Yeah, we've been really lucky. Uh, I think the scene in, in the UK kind of like, you know, lumped us in with a lot of really great bands. So you guys had back on Hail Destroyer, I was looking through the set list, or the playlist the other day, and I realized you had so many like features on it for a band that was not just starting out, but kind of just yeah, beginning to small. Yeah, you had like Billy Talent on there and stuff, and Rise Against. How did that all happen? Did you know those guys? Or? Yeah, so those were all bands that we had toured with uh, basically throughout 2007. So yeah. Alexis on Fire, like obviously we toured with those guys a ton. Uh, we had met. Billy Talent through the Alexis guys. Yeah. So we did like a whole US tour with those guys, became really good friends. And then it was actually Alexis and Billy Talent who recommended us to Rise Against to do their whole Euro tour. Cool. Yeah, so we, yeah. it was just all natural, like became really good friends with all those dudes. And all of those guys were kind of around while we were working on Hill Destroyer. So for me, it, it made sense to like have them be a part of the record. And luckily they were all stoked, so nice. everybody was down, yeah. Yeah, you still friends with them? You still in contact with them? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fire, yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I live like two blocks away from Wade, like we meet uh, all the time. And definitely like, yeah, see those really talented guys. I saw Ian saw last night at the nice. Wild and the Asian show. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't see Tim as often because he lives in Chicago. Yeah. But definitely every time like we're there or when we play festivals, with each other, it's like yeah. seeing old friends. Yeah, yeah. Like Hail Destroyer too was kind of like a Toronto scene sort of thing. Like yeah, besides Rise Against, those were all Toronto-based bands, and I guess that must have helped a bit. Like, Yo, totally. And it was super easy. Like you know, Ben was downtown. Mm -hmm. Wade was like hanging out um, with us like at the studio, so it was like yeah. more than natural. Nice. Um, and I think we always joke that like Rise Against is like an honorary Canadian band. <laughs> yeah. So I gotta ask, what would you say is like the most different thing now compared to back then with Hail Destroyer? Like between this new record and Hail Destroyer, what would you say has changed the most? Um, I don't know. I guess like obviously it's it's crazy for us. Like at that time, like we weren't like you said like a big band at all. I still don't think of ourselves as like a huge band, but it is crazy to think of how many people have like you know uh, found like a connection to that album and. How much of an important like record it's kind of become, yeah. so that even though we've put out a bunch of different records, it's like these are the shows that like you know people are so charged for and like really excited. So I think that's great, and it's yeah. really awesome to kind of like look back on that and to think of you know when we were putting that record out with like Distort and Jen and like everybody not like really knowing what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's really cool to look back like ten years later and just be like. Yeah. Oh man, like, it really worked. <laughs> yeah, and it's gotten to the point that you can play a 10th anniversary show and sell it out to yeah, the yeah, yeah. Right it's right away. Like, 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 it's really yeah. good, so. Yeah. yeah, it's a really awesome, this whole thing. Uh, were you guys straight edge back then? When you were doing Hail Destroyer, or did that yeah. kind of come later? No, 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 so Scott and I have always been straight edge, so like, while we were in Kings yeah. Rats. Yeah. And what was like behind that decision, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, not at all. Uh, I mean, Scott's never drank. Like, he's yeah. always been straight edge. For me, I just kind of didn't really like have that much fun with it anymore, and kind of just started gravitating more towards like being straight edge and hanging out with yeah. like a lot of really positive people. So totally. Yeah, it's cool. Uh, that's a fun questions after those ones there. Um, if you guys could tour with anyone, who do you think it would be? If you could wild the screen. Um, we've been trying to tour with Clutch forever. Oh, we would love to do a Clutch show. tour. We were actually like submitted for one like this year, and oh. it didn't work out. But uh, yeah, <laughs> we're forever like trying to tour with Clutch. I think another one would be Converge. We definitely oh, yeah. like huge yeah. Converge fans. So. Yeah, those are both like bands that we look to, especially as like being you know. Uh, guys who are, you know, very DIY, very in control of their own band, so I think we kind of look up to both of those guys a lot. Would you ever want to record with Kurt? I know he's recorded so many bands over the years. Yeah, we've talked about it. I guess, like, for us, you know, there's so much talent, like, within Canada, yeah. and there's so many, like, rad people in Canada that we haven't recorded with, so yeah, uh, it's, it's like, there's definitely a list for me, like, Oh, we could go and record, you know, with Joel Plaskett again and be in Halifax or be in Dartmouth specifically. Yeah. And like that would be amazing. I mean getting nice. to record with JP was great. Like yeah. I'd love to to do that again. So I don't know, I think Kurt's wicked and I think he does a lot of really rad stuff, but I feel like we'll probably still just keep it Canada. 
So you don't think the do it yourself that he's gonna stick around for the next album? You think next one you're gonna be going with the producer again? I mean, well, I mean, JP Peters definitely helped produce this record for right. sure. So I mean, I think we always have a good mix of that, like where we we work really heavily on the album ourselves and then go to someone to like help kind of punch it up to the next level. Cool. Um, oh, there's a fun question here. Um, who, if you could get anyone to come to a Cancer Bats concert, who do you think it would be? You could, mm -hmm. good or bad, I've had all sorts of answers. Oh my gosh. Um, I mean, I've always wished that like the Beastie Boys guys could come and like see how big of fans that we are and yeah. like to actually like hang out with those dudes. I mean, I'm a massive Beastie Boys fan, so I'd love to actually like meet them and be like, yo, we cover Sabotage because like you're one of the most important bands like ever. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that would probably be like if Fat Rock could come to a show. That would be so. That would be awesome. Yeah. One last two about the thing, Fat Sap. As, uh, where did the idea for that come from? Did you just suddenly wake up one day and say, you know, I've always wanted to have a Black Sabbath cover band? I mean, I think maybe everybody wants to be in a Black Sabbath cover band, actually. <laughs> but uh, we got asked to do it for a festival. So really? Sonosphere in the UK was like, would you guys want to do a cover set like later in the evening after your like afternoon set? And, How did uh, that come up? Did you just suddenly get an email asking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were just like, we're looking for another band to kind of close out the Sunday. <laughs> That's kind of random. And they were like, we thought like a cover set would be really fun. Um, so they were like, you can cover any band. You could do Pantera or ACDC or Black Sabbath. And we we're like, yeah. oh, we'll do Black Sabbath. Especially because Jay, our bass player, he already knew all the songs uh, on guitar. Like he's like a massive fan, but also like that's how we learned how to play guitar. So yeah. we're like, well, that's kind of already easy. Like he can just kind of teach Scott any of the songs that he doesn't know. And then Jay was really excited to like learn all of the songs on bass. Yeah. So that kind of like made it more fun. Yeah. And they're such classic tracks that kind of like transcend. Oh yeah. Every time period if you're in, you can play them in a million different ways. Yeah. And still sound good. Yeah. All right, so uh, kind of wrapping up here. Oh, yeah, I was gonna ask, I saw this as a rumor and I just have to ask you if it's true. Is it true that they named that dish at Sneaky Beans after you guys and Hail Destroyer? Yeah, yeah, the Destroyer. Destroyer. So that's yeah. like our idea was like the french fry nachos. That's like something <laughs> that we get at like restaurants that like when we see that they have like poutine and nachos, we just ask them to make like poutine nachos <laughs> basically. Um, so okay. when Sneaky Beans was doing like signature dishes with like fucked up and lights and like a yeah. bunch of different bands, they asked us and I was like, oh, we gotta make, like, we call them puchos, which is just poutine nachos, so we was like, you gotta make puchos. But it did so well that they've just, like, kept it on the menu. Would you say that's the biggest honor you guys have had? That's the ultimate immortal thing? Yeah, I mean, we love, we love Sneaky George Eats. and, like, everybody at Sneaky Eats, so definitely, yeah. Like, yeah, we're stoked that it's still on the menu. It's awesome. Yeah. And uh, last one here, since this is bucket list reviews, we gotta ask everybody, what's on your bucket list still? What's on Ian Cormier's bucket list? Um, I guess now that I'm really into motorcycling, there's like a few like huge things I wanna do on a motorcycle. I really wanna ride across Mongolia. Um, and <gasps> okay. I've talked about that with like a bunch of like my friends who have done it. And yeah, that's like be a modern Genghis Khan, get the fur hat out and everything, and what? just rampage across Mongolia. It's just such like a like a wild like space where yeah. like there's so much expanse and people are living nomadic lifestyles and like that's something very unique that yeah. I feel like for someone like we've traveled everywhere and we've been so fortunate. It's like I really want to like take that that step further and like go and yeah. see something like really out of the norm that I wouldn't uh, go see like with tour. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that's my list. What's your bike of choice if you don't mind me asking? Uh, I ride a Triumph Scrambler right now, which uh, I really like. But I think if I was gonna do uh, Mongolia, I'd probably get like a Husqvarna 701 or like a BMW, like one of the GS like yeah. 1250s. Yeah. Probably be my choice. Something that you won't go broke on with gas. Just yeah, don't do that in a Harley. Just that can handle like all the terrain. Yeah, yeah. 